Yeah, and the light's on. Are you sure it's focused? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be focused. It's focused. Solid. There. Okay. Now, you were born January 23rd, 1912 in Brockton. That's true. Okay. Tell me something about uh, your parents. Um, do you have rec uh, you know recollections of them when you were young? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, well, uh, let's see now. Uh, my mother uh, was very hardworking in Brockton. Uh, she had the housework there, which was quite different than housework is today. Uh, scrubbing the floors. There, were, there was no linoleum on the floor. Uh, no one in our neighborhood had linoleum on the floor. Therefore, there was just plain wood. And she used to scrub that every week on her hands and knees. In addition, there was uh, the washing that was done by hand. And in addition, uh, we had a, an iron coal stove uh, for heating. That is, it heated up the kitchen and the heat then permeated the rest of the apartment. And the, um, then it was necessary to bring coal up from the basement up to the third floor. And uh, taken all together, then taking care of the children and so on. So uh, the household chores were really very, very difficult, measured by things that happen today. I see. So, and what did your father, fa your father worked in a shoe factory? Yes, he worked in a shoe factory. Uh, in uh, Braintree, which is a neighboring town, and uh, that meant that in the morning he had to take a bus to go to work and then return kind of late in the evening. His work was that of a, uh, a stitcher on ladies' shoes. Hmm. And uh, basically, he, he was a socialist and a nonconformist when it came to religion, whereas my mother uh, observed all of the uh, all of the the ritual uh, requirements uh -huh. uh, uh, in the home, having four sets of dishes, lighting the candles on Friday night, and maintaining a kosher home all the way through. Oh boy, that's quite an extreme difference. It is quite uh, quite a great difference, and initially. Uh, initially, of course, it didn't have any impact on me because uh, as a child I wasn't influenced one way or the other. But ultimately when we moved to New York and uh, there was a closer proximity to a, a Jewish community, thoroughly Jewish community, uh, the result was that I used to go to a synagogue with uh, one of the sons of, uh, of a neighbor where we lived and um, my mother tended to have a greater influence uh, mm. ultimately, but I would say it was mixed because I was influenced by my father in terms of political affairs because he used to take me to uh, political meetings, um, meetings with uh, Norman Thomas speaking and other socialist leaders uh, so that I identified myself with the uh, socialist philosophy. However, when it came to religion, I identified myself with my mother's practices. I see. I see. Let me jump back a bit before we go forward and, and ask you whether they told you anything about their parents, about life in Koritz and Pohost, where, where they came from. Uh, there were only flashes uh, of, uh, uh, of references to their hometowns. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, they, they were sporadic. For example, I do know that uh, uh, in the town where my mother lived, uh, there was a lake and they used to go skating and once she fell through the ice and uh, her brother rescued her. Uh, it was an incident I recall. Also, I knew that her father was a tanner of leather. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was done in the uh, yard of their home. And uh, the, uh, the odor of the raw leather uh, was not appreciated much by neighbors who used to complain about it. Uh, but that was his occupation. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, father's father, after whom I am named, by the way, uh, he was a caretaker of forests 
mm. that belonged to Polish noblemen. Mm. And uh, my uncle, I remember when I interviewed him, told me that his father uh, used to come in uh, during the holiday season. Would this be Aaron? Yeah, Aaron. Uh -huh. probably. And I think I may still have a recording of the in interview that I mm. had with him. Mm. And uh, he told me about his father he used to come in on the holidays and the way he was dressed with heavy boots and so on mm -hmm. in the winter time. And, but that was his occupation. He hmm. was a forester. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Uh, let me ask you this. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Then once, I recall, um, there was a lansman, my father's lansman, uh, whose name was, I remember, Payevsky, who once told me, he said, you know, he said, you should be proud of your grandfather. He was a great scholar. Uh, very observant Jew and so on. So that was another reference to him. But beyond that, I really don't know too much about him. Mm. When uh, when you were growing up in uh, in Brockton, um, uh, I have a photo of you and Louis and uh, some of your childhood friends. Do you have any recollections of life as a child growing up in, Brook in Brockton? Yes, They're Massachusetts. <laughs> has very cold winters. In those days, colder, much colder than they are today. Mm -hmm. And the uh, children uh, going to school were equipped with hip boots mm -hmm. because the drifts of snow were very high. And uh, they didn't have a system there of clearing the, the streets immediately after a snowstorm. So the result was that all of the freight and everything that had to be transported was transported on large sledges uh -huh. drawn by horses, the Belgian dray horses. And the kids used to uh, catch up to the sledge and stand on the back rudders, uh -huh. uh, runners of the uh, sledges, and the steel rides that way. Uh, we used to enjoy walking through the highest uh, drifts of snow with our boots. And also, I recall, on the way to school, we passed, uh, we had to pass a, a little candy store, a grocery and a candy store, uh, on Summer Street, and uh, we would all be armed with our penny, and we'd stand on this special little platform so that we were able to see the selections of candy. And the reason I mention this is that in later years, my uncle, my father's younger brother, bought that store. And when I would come to visit him, I'd be now behind the counter <laughs> serving the children now who are going on to school. And another thing that I recall on the way to school was a blacksmith shop with an open door. And we would pass and stop by that sto the open door of the blacksmith and watch him at this flaming forge. And it was so much like Longfellow's uh, poem. The black the village blacksmith. Ah, yes. It was just an exact replica of that. So, I recall that also. What was school like in those days? You were school. We were. The thing that impressed me. Uh, after we moved to New York, was the vast difference between the discipline uh, and the atmosphere in the schools in Brockton as opposed to schools in New York. For one thing, the thing that impressed me was when I came to New York and I looked at the desks that the children had, they were all gouged out with mm. knives. The kids had carved out holes and mm. whatnot in them. Whereas in Brockton, if there was the slightest scratch found on your desk, you had to come back with lemon oil and after school polish that scratch out. Wow. And um, the discipline was far stricter. I see. And uh, what about uh, Louis? Did uh, Louis show an interest in art when he was a, a kid? No, not particularly. The thing that impressed me about my brother, whom I nicknamed Yuv, uh -huh. because uh, as a child he found it difficult to say Louis. Instead of saying Louis, he would say Yuvi. Right. And so I shortened it to Yuv, and to this day I still call him Yuv. <laughs> um, he was about well, three years younger than you. Right? Yeah. The uh, thing I recall about him is that uh, 
once I was trying to reach up to a, a porch in the back of the house and I stood on a box and there was, I put another box on top and I still couldn't reach it and I said to him, see if you can find another box. What he did was he pulled the bottom box out. Oh, no. He pulled the bottom box out Smart. to give to me and of course you know the result. I fell and banged my head on a supporting pillar of the porch. Um, <laughs> But uh, otherwise, I uh, don't recall too much about him because each, each of us, you know, when a child is, uh, there's a three-year-old difference with, among children, yeah. they have uh, different playmates and so on. Yes. So when, th when did you start um, cycling? Uh, was it when you were in Brockton as a kid or later oh, no, on? Oh, that was much, much later. Much I see. later. Well, uh, how old were you when you, went, when you left Brockton and came to Brooklyn? Oh, I was uh, 10 years old. I see. And uh, I started the school here in the PS 87, I remember. Uh huh. And, uh, and what was Brooklyn time, like in those days? When you... Brooklyn was, well, the section in which we lived was uh, uh, Ocean Heights on the outskirts of Brownsville. Uh, and uh, it was thoroughly Jewish. Uh, None of our playmates were Gentile, um, and uh, the uh, the thing that interested us were this, the subjects that we studied in school were the things that we carried away with us even <coughs> afterwards and became part of our play. For example, in later years, I remember when I was going to high school, I think it was, and studied geometry, for example. The heroes on the block were the kids who could, uh, uh, who could show the congruence of triangles on the basis of angle side angle, let us say, mm -hmm. and they would draw this out on the sidewalk in chalk, and the man who was able to execute these things was the hero of the day. That's a big change from now, I guess. It is. It's a very big change. Another thing was that uh, the the neighborhood, of course, uh, changed significantly. Uh, there was very little crime in the area. Uh, the um, in the winter time, we would slide down this hill in sleds on the in the middle of the street. Um, hmm. I see. What were your interests then? Your your courses. What what courses did you like the most? Um, Surprisingly, I liked Latin. I did very well in that. St I started to study Latin. I think it was in the seventh, seventh grade. We studied. St Is that where you got your nickname, Caesar? No, oh. uh, we um, uh, we were studying uh, Julius Caesar by Shakespeare, and uh, we had to memorize uh, some of the speeches, the speech by Mark Antony and the speech by Brutus. I see. Uh, funeral of uh, Caesar and I used to go around reciting this during the day and uh, my friends therefore nicknamed me Caesar and it stuck to this very day. And how, how old were you then? Uh, I was about, let's see, uh, seven, about 13, 14, something like that. I see. Um, hmm. When, uh, oh, you told me about your friends, and um, when did you become active in the Communist Party? Because that seemed to lead up to... No, I was really never a member of the Communist Party. Um, you had to be a certain age to in the party. What happened first was uh, I became a member of the YCL, which is the Young Communist League. I see. And then ultimately, I was expelled because of my association with Trotskyites. Mm -hmm. This seems to have been the uh, the popular thing to do for young uh, intellectuals to go into the Communist Party. Then it wasn't. The yes, of course. Uh, either you either became a socialist, uh, which was considered kind of namby pamby, you know, going coming going halfway. Mm -hmm. But uh, any, at that time, particularly 
considering the economic conditions, I recall my father out on strike at a factory and so on. And there was a, a, a tendency for the kids to identify themselves. Not all of them, uh, some of them. Some of them had no interest at all, their interest in sports and things like that. But anyone with some intellectual bent mm -hmm. uh, identified himself with uh, either uh, the uh, Young People's Socialist League or the Young Communist League. I see. And, and do you, made, you made friends, I imagine, most of your, uh, many of your friends were through the left-wing movement? Ultimately, uh, that's what happened. It's a, sort of a precipitation. Uh, people began to group together on the basis of their political interests and uh, all their associations were in that little subgroup. I, re I remember you told me stories about uh, some of your friends, like Prof, who was very athletic, and uh, you had this wild meeting. Oh yes, we had, uh, we arranged a, uh, a symposium at the Labor Lyceum on Sackman Street, I recall, and we had developed a lot of, printed a lot of circulars and distributed them all over the city. We had a tremendous audience assembled. And uh, this uh, symposium or debate was between a uh, member of the Socialist Party, uh, Communist Party, and uh, someone who came from the Trotskyite wing. And um, in the course of the discussion, uh, there was a question period, and uh, the uh, prof went up on stage to present his point of view, and uh, in the middle of his presentation, uh, Joe Ross, the quote, Gauleiter, communist Gauleiter in the neighborhood, who was chairing the meeting, simply gave him a push, and he pushed him right off the stage. And what he did was he did a somersault in the air and landed on his feet. <laughs> um, tell me uh, about how you met um uh, Ma, wasn't that through? Was that through these this uh, these left this left wing movement? Yes, or was that there is a true. common friend who? No, no. What? Yes. Yeah, so what happened was this: um, we uh, in East New York, we uh, rented uh, some of us mm. rented a, a little uh, a loft, mm. and we started an organization called the Student Forum, mm -hmm. and. Um, our membership consisted of uh, young people in the neighborhood who gathered together for discussions and also to go out onto the street uh, to hold public meetings. We would go to a corner, let's say on Pitkin Avenue, mm -hmm. and we'd have uh, one of these uh, folding platforms. Mm -hmm. We set up the platform and a whole series of us would get up and start speaking. Before you know it, we'd have a crowd around. And uh, it was always a political speech we were making for a particular candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of our activities. Another activity of ours was, uh, in those days, they would be evicting people, mm -hmm. putting their furniture on the street. And we would go and take that furniture, carry it up the third, fourth floor. There were no elevators. Mm -hmm. We would break the lock, because the landlord or the marshal had placed a lock on mm -hmm. the door. We would break the lock. And we put all the furniture back again. Uh, those are some of the things that, that we, we did in those days. And then how did, how did but you... But now, this, yeah. uh, this organization uh, was actually, a, a presumably, a front organization mm -hmm. for the Young Communist League. Mm -hmm. See, a communist developed cells within organizations, mm -hmm. within unions, within uh, clubs, uh, in all sorts of... Uh, uh, group activities or organizations, mm -hmm. they set up little cells. The idea was to try to control the organization by surrounding yourself with a, a lot of members of the organization mm -hmm. who became friendly with you so that you could, uh, let's say, have a resolution presented uh, which had a communist implications mm -hmm. and you would get the organization to pass and sponsor resolutions that followed the communist party line. Now, what developed were uh, opposition groups who were aware of that mm -hmm. and who would, uh, who would oppose the efforts to pass such resolutions. Well, in this student forum, 
there was this little cell, mm -hmm. and uh, they controlled the activities of this organization. But there was an opposition group composed of a few Trotskyites. That was Herb, Canarac, uh, and uh, there was a prof, his name was Irving Geldman, and uh, Sam Gordon, mm -hmm. whose name was really Sam Cohen. His mother's name was Gordon. He liked that better, so he changed it to Sam Gordon. And the, this little group represent an opposition, mm -hmm. an opposition to the Stalinist line. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, uh, this guy Joe Ross, who was the uh, Gauleiter, quotes, mm -hmm. of the uh, neighborhood, brought charges against us. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted to have us expelled from the student forum. Now, obviously, he might have had charges against us if we were members of the Young Communist League, which we were not at that time. And he could have expelled us there because then you would be opposing the principles of the, the Stalinist party. Mm -hmm. uh, but since he controlled that organization, he felt he could control the organization because he had a majority of the people with him. He brought charges for our expulsion. Mm -hmm. and it was about that time that I think I met uh, Mommy uh, uh -huh. at the time. And uh, her brother uh -huh. knew something about this guy, Joe Ross. Oh, which brother now? Uh, that was uh, Sam. Sam. Sam uh -huh. and A.B., I think. Same because Sonia was Joe Ross's sister. Yeah. Sam, right? no, well, he, that he had done certain things mm -hmm. that uh, were not quite uh, proper uh -huh. uh, for anyone who was uh, had any philosophy for workers, yes. for favor of workers' causes and stuff like that. So I used him as a witness. We used him as a witness in this so-called trial. I and see. Sam Gordon, who had a great sense of humor, mm -hmm. uh, said... Um, in, in the course of his defense, he brought a uh, an iron, electric iron, uh -huh. thing, and uh, he brought a roll of toilet paper. Mm -hmm. And he said, if anyone here wants to press charges, mm -hmm. the charges are on this paper, uh -huh. and here is the iron, you can press the charges. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We thought it was rather <laughs> comical because what were the charges? Uh -huh. The charges were that we had been seen eating spaghetti together with this guy, Prof, who was a known Trotskyite. Oh, that goodness. was the charge that we had fraternized with the enemy, so to speak. <laughs> now, how old were you when all this was going on? Well, I think I just, at that time, just, just, well, I, I was going to college at that time. I see. Yeah. Okay. I was a member of the National Student League, and I, at that time, organized the uh, uh, Political Science Club at Brooklyn College, and I organized the, uh, what else, I forget, some of the, oh, the Education Club, and so on. Now, now through all this uh, So political... it was interesting to me, uh, yeah. the reason I say this to you, when I heard that, um, when I heard that Pete organized a club at, uh, at the school there at Vassar, I said, oh, history repeats itself, except that the club is a bicycle club. I see. <laughs> so some things have changed through two generations. Right, exactly. <clears throat> well, um, about this time, did you have any idea what you wanted to do? Uh, did you know that you wanted to go into teaching? Uh, had you made that commitment? Well, yet? at that time, because of economic conditions and because of the fact that nobody had any money, the natural tendency was for those people to enter uh, City College, mm. Brooklyn College, City College, and so on. And it was, uh, you needed an 85% average in order to get in in those days. And so it was populated mostly by Jewish kids who were getting in. And uh, since they weren't able to establish any uh, discriminatory policies, and the result was that uh, uh, the uh, most of the student body was Jewish. Mm. And did you know what you wanted to do then? Uh, I, yes, I, everybody was studying uh, pedagogy. They were all going to go into teaching. Mm. Although uh, I had a feeling 
that I might want to study uh, pre-medical or pre-dental uh, studies mm -hmm. so that ultimately I might go into dentistry because after school I worked for a dentist yes, as I, a dental assistant. And uh, didn't you, weren't you selling dental equipment for a while? Too? Well, no. The first thing that happened was uh, when I was in high school, after school, I worked for this dentist at the chair as his assistant. And then um, once someone came in who sold dental supplies to him and who spotted me and he said, you know, I can use you. Would you come and work for me? I said, fine. So I started to work for him and I got to learn something about the dental supply business. And then when I uh, went to college, I started my own business of uh, dental supplies and I, I started uh, selling, buying and selling dental supplies out of the house. To, while you were going to college? Uh, yeah, this was I while see. I was going to college. Now, actually, uh, getting into the 30s already and you're, it's really uh, the middle of the depression. I mean, what was that like? Those depression years in the 30s. <laughs> See, it was very difficult. I uh, I started to work. Let's see. I started to work then after that in a uh, um, a store that sold dry goods, men's furnishings, and uh, uh, all sorts of things in in the dry goods field. See, the first place I worked was on 14th Street, I remember. Mm. I think this was after I graduated, though. Uh, Did before, you work for Nathan's? No, no, Did this, was, Nathan's? this was before and after. Uh, during the latter years of uh, school, I remember working after school uh, in this place on 14th Street. Now, what I recall particularly about that was the sleazy way. This was a, a schlock store. Mm -hmm. Uh, to give you an idea of how they operated, uh, the uh, manager of the store would take these inexpensive shirts mm -hmm. and he'd take the cellophane off. Mm -hmm. He'd throw them on the floor and stamp on them mm -hmm. and ruffle them up and then place them on a table outside the store in the front with a sign, 50 cents, something like that. Now, if someone came in to buy those shirts, uh, he was besieged by a salesman who tried to sell him a shirt for 75 cents or for a dollar fifty or wherever it was. And instead of selling him one, they tried to sell him several. And the hero of the day was the guy who was able to sell him most shirts at the highest price. I wasn't very good at that. Mm -hmm. or, um, and I didn't last too long because <laughs> I wasn't able to do much selling using that style. The uh, person who bought one of these shirts, by the way, when he took it home and uh, washed it, he found that it had shrunk two sizes. So he'd come back to the store and he'd want his money back and they'd say, well,